tonight. Um, we're recording this meeting, <laughs> and yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about it a lot tonight. So, um, to introduce her, uh, Dr. Twakley is a board certified physical medicine and rehabilitation physician scientist. She specializes in interventional spine and sports medicine treatments that help people achieve high performances at all stages of life. In her own words, physiatry allows her experiences as a physician, athlete, and researcher to dovetail. Um, so she got her BA at Yale, where she was a record setter in the long jump and triple jump as part of the track and field team, uh, before going on to get her medical degree from Harvard, her MPH and residency at Johns Hopkins, and her fellowship at Hospital for Special Surgery following which she uh, practiced at the Brigham for a few years and now has made her way to Pitt and Yale simultaneously, holding dual appointments at the Yale School of Public Health Departments of Chronic Disease Epidemiology, as well as the Social and Behavioral Sciences Department, and then at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Dr. Tawakli approaches her work with a sense of compassion and innovation, and I've seen this firsthand in the holistic approach to patient care that she shared with us during a lecture here at Yale back in the winter. As a scientist, Dr. Tawakli Wasornu directs the Sports Equity Lab, um, which is an interdisciplinary research group that focuses on dismantling inequities in sport while amplifying sport's role as a positive change agent in society. Her research is athlete-centered and translational in nature, designed to influence global sport. She is a member of the International Olympic Committee's Working Group to Prevent Harassment and Abuse in Sport, is the co-chair of the Safe Sport International Research Committee, and is chair of the International Society for Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine Task Force on Physical Activity for Persons with Disability. She also travels to Ghana a couple of times a year to help incorporate preventive health and sports medicine. And we're so fortunate to have her traveling virtually here to be with us tonight. So without further ado, Dr. Twakley. Hey, thank you so much, Martha. That's a beautiful introduction. Um, and I'm so grateful to be here with you guys. It's, I was really honored to get the invitation and just to learn more about your group, it's, it's very exciting. What Martha didn't say is that the whole time I was doing the training in physiatry, I was also competing in the long term for, for my team, Ghana, and, um, which is the crazy way to not recommend. But at the same time, it gave me huge amounts of anecdotal data that I just every single day in clinic download onto my patients. I mean, I really feel like when you walk the walk, patients can feel that. Um, and it makes a difference. And you should you should not you should not poo poo the other parts of your life because patients relate to it, and that's where you can really bring in your own anecdotes. So I'm going to talk to you guys today about that thing because that's pretty much what I treat every single day. Um, and I'll go through my approach to it. At the end of the lecture, I'd love to just get questions, any practical questions that you have about it, um, or about my experience and how I kind of feed it into my clinical practice, because it really is sort of like I show up as my full self every single day. And that's the thing that I think that most physiatrists do. So excited about uh, sharing my perspective. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see that? Okay, perfection. So I'm gonna do that really soon. All right, so the lecture this evening is titled uh, Physiatric Approach to Low Back Pain, Clinical Pearls and Pitfalls. Thanks, Martha, for the wonderful introduction. So in this presentation, I'll describe three things. First, my assessment and also the neurobiology of low back pain. Second, some of the medical management and its evidence. And then finally, clinical pearls that surface in practice that I think are just really quick um, things that you can take with you, like popcorn pieces of wisdom that you can take with you into your clerkships tomorrow even, um, or even into your approach to your own um, in your family's episodes of back pain. So the first comment is that axial low back pain is one of the most challenging clinical conditions to treat, even for us spine specialists. So um, when you look at the primary care field or you look at neurology, um, internal medicine, a lot of the physicians will say, this is the worst potential. This is the worst thing that I hear as a, as a chief complaint because it's so hard to kind of get better. Um, just in terms of the epidemiology, at least 84% of the global population will experience low back pain at one point in their life. So huge prevalence. Um, it is far and away the leading cause of disability worldwide. So those data have been have been worked on and investigated for decades um, and they, they hold pretty true. Lumbar radicular pain 
which is different than axial non-radiating low back pain, is in some ways easier to manage. Why is that? Because the nerve roots, especially in the lumbar sacral spine, have a very typified and almost topographic distribution down the lower extremities. So you can typically ask the patient where, where's the course of your pain, and you can more or less identify the most likely nerve root or radicular source that is causing the pain. Um, some people say, oh, I have my sciatica or my sciatica is kicking up. The important thing to know is that the sciatic nerve is actually made up of three lumbosacral nerve roots, not one. And so the term sciatica is a little bit of a misnomer. It's a little bit stronger as a position to get more precise about which nerve root you're talking about. But when people say my sciatica is kicking up, what they mean is they have lumbar radicular pain. Now, just as Africa is not a country, low back pain is not a diagnosis, it's a complaint. Um, and low back pain can be caused by any one of these conditions. And just, this is a non-comprehensive list. Okay, it can be caused by disc herniation of some kind, uh, facet joint arthritis, lumbar myofascial pain, sacroiliac joint pain, lumbar spinal stenosis, scoliosis or spinal lobosthesis, any kind of alignment issue, post laminectomy pain, so post-surgical, hip impingement can actually show up the same way as lumbar pain does, a lumbar compression fracture, and then a seronegative spinal arthropathy. So something that's a little bit more rheumatologic or medical can also show up in the same way. All patients, again, I always tell them you're allowed to have more than one diagnosis. So you might check one of these boxes or two or three, it's fine. Our job as physiatrists is to differentiate and tease out that Gordian nut, Gordian's nut and say it's probably this, this, and this, or just this. Um, I have a very similar response when people come in and say my diagnosis is low back pain or when a primary care doctor or internal medicine says the patient has as a diagnosis, low back pain. Um, it's like when people come up to me and say they want, they want to go to Africa. And I say, if you could kindly name the country, it would make me feel a lot better. So radicular pain, which can track with low back pain, means that, again, the pain radiates down the leg. It's transmitted along a lumbar nerve root. Um, low back pain may or may not be present with radicular pain. That's always interesting. So a patient might show up with just leg pain, thigh pain, and foot pain, and that's it. And it could be lumbar radicular pain. I had one patient show up with just medial ankle pain right on the medial malleolus, L4 radiculopathy. So it doesn't always have to track with the low back pain. So the question is, how do you begin to differentiate? Well, start with the patient's demographics. Epidemiology does matter. So a few paradigms for you to just to keep in the back of your mind. When you think about the musculoskeletal system, just think about the phrase, we're only as strong as our weakest link. Because throughout the life course, there are different structures in the musculoskeletal system that are made to be more vulnerable just due to their changing anatomy. So when you're young, it's more like your bones that are, because they're growing. You still have the, you still have your growth plates. They're still developing. And so if someone comes in with back pain as a kid, we think about the bones first and foremost. Interestingly, that comes back at the, at the end of life. But but in the middle, in middle age, we think more about the disc that typically is related to occupation, environment, movement patterns, and just the neurobiology of the developing disc. All of us by the age of 19 will have some degree of disc degeneration. And over the life course, usually between about 20 and 60, the disc just goes from being this kind of like buoyant water balloon to being more like a chalk filled old sock, basically. So it's just super vulnerable in that middle part of life. At the later stages of life, the bone again becomes more vulnerable. Arthritic overgrowth, drying out, wear and tear. So think about it in that terms, like what's the most weak, most, what's the most vulnerable, what's made you the most vulnerable based on this person's developmental stage. And then you can start to hone your diagnosis based on that. Further data on epidemiology. So there is an 84% lifetime prevalence of low back pain. Um, some people think that might be secondary to due to increased surveillance. So we're just asking people more if they have low back pain. Um, and fortunately, 90% spontaneously improved within six weeks. There's a 43% lifetime prevalence of lumbar radicular pain. So you see there's a, there's a difference between axial and lumbar radicular pain. And then that experiences a linear increase in prevalence from four to 65. Again, like I was saying, between the middle ages of life, very much the disc, the nerves, they're vulnerable. Factors that are associated with the development and maintenance of lumbar pain and pathology as a little kid is spending long hours watching TV or on your screen, maybe on your smartphone, psychosocial stress, obesity, 
a positive family history of low back pain, and then low baseline levels of physical activity. The most common diagnosis in youth, muscle pain, strain, spondylosis, scoliosis, some of the really bad things like tumors as well, but that comes along with constitutional symptoms. The most common diagnosis in adults, disc herniation. Sometimes you'll see IDD, intervertebral disc desiccation. The most common diagnosis in the elderly is going to be spinal stenosis, narrowing in the spinal canal, facet arthritis, arthritis, or a synovial cyst associated with that facet arthritis. So continuing on the track, how do you differentiate? Not only do you take a, take a consideration of the epidemiology and what's most common occurring in the age group, but you also have to listen very carefully to your patient's clinical history. I think physiatrists are best at this. Um, we Some people say that we're a little bit too detail oriented. We ask the patient about their occupation over the life course. I ask the patient about the physical activity in sports over the whole life course. What did you play when you were a kid? Were you a high level gymnast, constantly in lumbar spinal extension? Were you a linebacker, constantly in lumbar spinal extension? Were you a wrestler, often in lumbar spinal extension when you were age five through age 12, for, for example, because it's the same spine you've had since you were born. And what has been exposed to matters to me in terms of what's been made more vulnerable anatomically. Then you ask, of course, about the location of the pain. Does it radiate? Is it axial? The quality of the pain, what does it feel like to you in your own words? Your preferred positions, do you prefer to sit, stand, walk? And then what makes it better? Then what makes it worse? Alleviating, exacerbating factors. I always ask about previous treatments and how well they worked. So if someone says I did physical therapy and it didn't work, not good enough. Can you clarify what exactly you did in therapy? Was it mostly extension based? Was it mostly flexion based? Was it exercise? Was it heat? Did they put a hot pad on you and walk away? You got to clarify all that so you understand exactly what worked and what didn't and why. Drilling down further, location, quality, preferred positions and alleviating and exacerbating factors. Let's talk about um, positions. So if someone comes in with sitting pain, very commonly, it's one of these things. Discogenic pain. Sometimes you'll see the term vertebrogenic pain. We'll get to why that is in a second. Hip impingement or A, proximal hamstring disease, a lumbar compression fracture, post laminectomy pain, and limb myofascial pain. So that's kind of in the category of sitting pain. If the person says, I have pain with upright standing and walking, then you start thinking about the posterior ele elements of the spine. The facet joints, they're also called Z joints. So you'll see facet and Z joints used interchangeably. Congenital or degenerative lumbar spinal stenosis. Sacroiliac joint pain shows up the same way. Again, lumbar myofascial pain always pops onto every slide about that pain. Scoliotic lumbar spondylosis, post laminectomy, compression fractures, and then spondylarthropathy can also show up with standing pain. A history of shear or torsional axial strain. Think about the discs. Discs are very vulnerable to torsion and to shear as well as to compression. And then again, the posterior elements of the spine, those lumbar facet joints. Person says they have a history of trauma, like a motor vehicle accident, or they fell and hit their back on something like a balance beam. I had a gymnast who had that as her um, chief presenting symptom. Lumbar myofascial pain, sacroiliac joint, compression fracture, disc herniation. So these are how you differentiate when someone is giving you their clinical history. The high degree of diagnostic overlap, however, as you saw, there were a few things that showed up on many slides. It boils down to the anatomy. When you look at the innervated structures of the spine, so this is one, it's almost a full motion segment. The motion segment of the spine is a bone, a disc, and a bone. That's one motion segment. So this is kind of the opposite. It's a disc, a bone, and a disc. <laughs> it's just the best image I could find. But um, the key is there are only a few actual innervated structures, meaning structures that can produce pain. The posterior one-third of the disc, highly innervated. Interspinous ligament, the bursa, as well as the muscle, paraspinally, highly innervated. The periosteum, or the saran wrap surrounding that facet joint, innervated. The vertebral end plates, which are just a little different than the disc, but the interface, also innervated. And then finally, the dorsal root ganglion. That guy is a huge problem because it's a sensory organ of the spine and it just hurts when it's irritated in some kind of a way. Also, so you know, millimeters really matter in the spine. So patients will say, oh, when I make a tiny move this way or a tiny move that, that way, I experience more pain. In my mind, it makes perfect sense because the spine is not a lot of play in there as you can see. 
So the neurobiology of lumbar radicular pain, it boils down to what's happening at the dorsal region of that DRG, which is the sensory organ um, of the nerve itself. Um, just start, look over here, it's a busy slide. Just look over here. The starting point in most examples, whether it's I had a motor vehicle accident, I was starting my lawnmower, I had just completed the gymnastics routine and went into a hyperextension at the end. Usually there's some sort of a mechanical injury. A common, a common history is I was doing deadlifts at the gym, which puts huge pressure on that L5S1 disc. Um, so typically there's a mechanical injury which then translates into a chemical process, i.e. inflammation, which can cause a chemical injury. The chemical injury, usually that's exposure of the nucleus repulsus, which we'll get, we'll, we'll get into in a second, predominantly precipitates inflammatory or nociceptive type pain, ouch pain. Coming over to this side of the diagram, nerve injury or nerve cell death can precipitate neuropathic or nerve pain. So if you just kind of differentiate in your mind what's happening, is there a mechanical injury, a chemical injury, or both? Does patient have nociceptive or neuropathic pain or both? You start to paint a picture of what's going on at the level of the spine in your mind. Ultimately, however, the DRG, the dorsal root ganglion, those neurons are sensitized by the inflammatory mediators in the chemical injury side. And then they're hypersensitive to mechanical forces like compression and shear and ongoing hyperextension um, as, they, as they are sensitized. So that's the neurobiology of it. Circling back to the physiatric pain assessment, let's come back to location quality. Again, we have a beautiful roadmap uh, when it comes to the gymptomes and the myotomes of the lumbar cervical spine. L5, L4, and S1, these kind of three overlapping um, structures down here, are very commonly implicated um, in either discogenic axial low back or lumbar radicular pain. So at some point, it's nice to just memorize this dermatoma map so you have a sense of what flows where. And the patient says, I have pain here, I have pain here, I have pain here. You start to put together in your mind what nerve could be involved. When it comes to quality, preferred positions, and alleviating factors, ouch pain is inflammatory or nociceptive pain. Patients will use words like sharp, searing, arresting, aching, tight. Once they start talking about, you're gonna think I'm crazy doc, that's usually neuropathic pain. They're like, it feels like burning, like this is like a hot candle, cramping, it feels like hot wax. Is, they have all kinds of descriptions for it. Neuropathic pain is the great mimicker. So it can show up in a lot of different ways. Thinking about mechanical pain, when patients start telling you, I really can't or won't reach out to tie my shoes. Okay, that's position dependent pain it can usually be, re be reproduced during the physical exam. So different types of pain in terms of quality. When it comes to our physical exam, I typically assess pain with lumbar flexion, extension, and oblique extension at first. Palpatory exams are useful in certain instances, but motion assessments are typically a little bit more reliable, although neither are perfect. So if a patient says they have flexion-based pain, meaning when they flex their spine forward. Classically, that's indicating they have maybe a central or paracentral disc herniation because when you flex forward, you increase the interdiscal pressure, which we'll get to in a second. When a patient says they have extension-based pain or oblique extension-based pain, then you start thinking, because that arthropathy. If it's a disc, it could be a lateral disc or a subarticular disc that lives under the facet joint. So it mimics the posterior element disease. Also, they might have central or neuroforaminal spinal stenosis. Uh, this data, the reliability of a motion assessment to diagnose an anatomical structural injury in the spine, comes from Nakamson et al., who back in the 1970s, this would never get IRB approval today, just so you know. He did this crazy experiment on military recruits where he placed basically prods into the lumbar sacral discs and then tested intradiscal pressure in different positions. What he found was that upright standing is essentially neutral. So you think about upright standing as sort of baseline here, it's shaded in yellow. When you lay on your side, the amount of intradiscal pressure reduces by 25%. It goes down further when you lay supine. In contrast, when you are forward flexed while standing, 
the amount of intradiscal pressure increases by about 50%, sometimes as much as 120%. <laughs> when you're seated, like many of us are when we're working, it increases by about 40%. And then when you're seated and slumping forward, as you can see here, the intradiscal pressure increases quite significantly. So this period looks like, this uh, posture looks like what? Doing deadlifts. <laughs> and this posture looks like what? Just being after maybe a very difficult test at, at, on a, online or something like that. But we oftentimes assume these postures in daily living. So this gives us a sense of what is happening at the level of the disc in different postural positions. Importantly, just four hours of sitting results in significant L4-5 disc height loss or bulge as demonstrated on MRI findings. This can correct with intermittent standing breaks. So that old adage that you know nowadays a lot of the Mayo Clinic spine doctors are putting forward, stand every hour, at least for 90 seconds. It's because of this. You essentially wanna reduce intradiscal pressure during the course of your day. And it's reliable as demonstrated by some of these really interesting studies. In addition to the motion assessment, again, flexion, extension, and oblique extension, I also palpate the spine. Um, to be 100% accurate, the arm should really be by the patient's side like that to facilitate relaxation of the paraspinals. If the patient is tense or in some sort of baby cobra position, really all bets are off because they've actually activated those muscles and it's impossible to palpate the spine through them. I also don't examine the neck any other way than supine. Why do I do that? Because the head, which is between eight and 12 pounds, it's, it's a really quite, it's like basically a bowling ball sitting on a straw as our cervical spine. Unfortunately, as it's like sitting against gravity, this cervical paraspinals really do tense up. And so it's very challenging to be able to palpate the spinal elements while somebody is either seated or standing. So the physiatry version of a spine exam typically is optimally um, positioning the patient so that we can palpate what we need to palpate, get to the paraspinal muscles, which in that position are totally relaxed and no longer taut. So that's the area I palpate when the patient is prone. It's important also to document the presence or absence of what we call dural tension. So if you remember the neurobiology of radicular pain, meaning it's injury or irritation to a nerve root, a hot or sensitized dorsal ganglion or nerve root fibers really um, should be totally insensitive to an otherwise innocuous stretch force. This position, which is called a seated slump test, is an otherwise innocuous, innocuous stretch force. Unfortunately, if that nerve root is hot or sensitized, then that innocuous force actually causes an abnormal increase in neural tension uh, when the nerve fiber becomes restricted or caught anywhere along its path because of the presence of inflammatory mediators. Um, and so it hurts. In terms of what we're doing here, if you can imagine the entire central nervous system from the brain down through the spinal cord and all the exiting nerve roots, being like a contiguous structure. When we put the skull down, chin down to the chest, bring the leg up and then dorsiflex the foot, it's as though we're tensioning or loading a bow, like a bow and arrow, um, and that bow is the dura. The neuro exam, i.e. looking at the deep tendon reflexes, the patella, the Achilles, and the hamstring, tell us how well the nerve is functioning. The patella reflex talk tells you about L4, the Achilles reflex tells you about S1, and the hamstring reflex, which can be hard to get, tells you about L5. Sensation, both light touch and pinprick, tell you about how well the nerve root is functioning. Again, in terms of the dermatomes that you follow, same topographic pad, uh, map is what we follow to assess both light touch and pinprick. These are the points that I try to focus on in order to get to L3, L4, L5, S1, and S2. This is the last part of the neuro exam. It's gonna be your reflex, it's gonna be your sensation, and finally your strength. When the patient is seated, I check their ankle dorsiflexors, their extensor hallucis longus, which is basically the big toe extensor by itself, all toe extensors, the ankle inverters, knee extensors, hip flexors, hip uh, knee flexors, hip abductors, which are basically, as you're seated, push your knees out to the sides. When the patient is sideline, I check their hip abductors again, as well as your hip extensors. And then when they're standing, I check their ankle plantar flexors by having them do single leg calf raises. 
You may know normal muscle grade to zero muscle grade. It's usually on a scale of zero to five, five out of five normal strength, zero out of five no strength, and everything in between. The key to do a great neuro exam, you guys can do this on your clerkships, um, is when you're testing ankle dorsiflexors or extensor hallucis longus, please don't have the patient's leg flopping in space. You want the ankle or the heel to be rooted on the floor. That gives the patient a biomechanical advantage and also gives you an opportunity to isolate the muscles that you want to isolate, which are the anterior shin muscles and then the extensor hallucis longus. They'll get major points in any physiatric clinic if you do that, rather than have the patient's leg dangling in space, which is an open chain maneuver, which is a lot um, noisier. Don't do that. <laughs> so in terms of mechanism-based therapies for lumbar pain, in other words, why a referral to multimodal rehab services really does work. Well, again, the biology of the intervertebral disc makes the case for our, our treatments. Um, the nucleus repulsus, um, which is a, a group of round cells right there in the middle of the intervertebral disc, this kind of fluffy cloud-looking structure right here, it's made up of predominantly type 2 collagen. It's really rich in proteoglycans, which means that it can withstand compression and create this like beautiful hydrostatic pressure. Um, it's almost as though it's pushing out, um, if, as if you imagine a water balloon, it's almost pushing out on the annulus fibrosis. It's also importantly immunologically privileged, which means that when we're born, our immune system has no idea what it is. It's totally contained within the annulus um, fibrosis. So therefore the immune system is unclear as to what this material is. That's important for why the inflammatory cascade is so robust when it gets exposed. The annulus fibrosis, in contrast, these are spindle-shaped cells that are predominantly type 1 collagen. Um, the fibrosis is actually super intricate. It's 15 to 25 distinct laminate layers, and they're not really beautifully oriented. They're more like orthogonally oriented, so it's like a basket or a tire tread. Um, there are mechanoreceptors found in the outer two layers, uh, and the loss of mechanical structure directly impacts the cell biology. So the mechanics impact the biology, and the biology impacts the mechanics. It ends up being the speed back loop, which is super interesting, I think. Importantly, that is a precipitant of disc degeneration, the mechanical loss of structure. So the key, as I mentioned, the nucleus pyrolysis is immunologically privileged, is that age-related disc degeneration, obviously, as I mentioned, may start as early as 19 years old or 20, um, which means that there's decreased blood supply to the dual end plate. And when that happens, the nucleus pyrolysis can become exposed. It doesn't have to frankly herniate. It also doesn't have to actually extravasate. It can simply be exposed due to a weakening in the outer fibrosis, almost like creating a window. Once that happens and the immune system sees it, there is an extremely robust immunologically mediated inflammatory response where you get the release of inflammatory cytokines, pro-neovascular growth factors, substance B, interleukin-6, 9, all of it. And that's why when people have back pain, sometimes it can be out for a week, or they can say, I had, I felt a pop, I was doing a deadlift, and I couldn't move, I couldn't walk. The inflammatory response is that severe. When it comes to what we do, there is evidence for short-term relief um, of lumbar epidural steroid injections transferaminally for this type of um, injury. However, commonly, these treatments alone are insufficient to provide long-term benefits. So that's point one. What about if we were to do two level transform epidural steroid injections? Well, this study, which was coordinated by one of my um, my old mentors, Dr. Singh up in New York, showed that there was greater improvement in pain of function as a result of two levels as, as, as opposed to one level. But again, by itself, this type of treatment is not sufficient. It's part of a, a depiction, but it's not sufficient. Finally, I thought this was a really good um, uh, paper by J.J. Kennedy who's a great, uh, and Matt, Matt Smook, who's a great physiatrist out at, at, at Stanford. They showed um, that despite a high degree of success at six months, again, people feel better in the short term, they're happy with the treatment. The majority of these patients do experience a recurrence at some point in five years. So this is part of the picture. Injections are great. That's what I do. Many people do it, but it's not the full picture. What about nerve memory stabilizing agents for neuropathic pain? Well, I think about three, gabapentin, Lyrica, and CBD. There's a great article that came out in the New York Times in 19 that's in millions take gabapentin, but there's scant evidence that it works. That's true. 
But what it does is stabilize the sodium potassium flow and flux across the nerve membrane. And so it decreases the transmission of neuropathic symptoms if the patient has them. So oftentimes this is part of the treatment protocol as well. What about physical therapy? Well, for a paracentral disc herniation, like I showed you in the image previously, the McKinsey-based therapy um, technique leverages spine anatomy to treat dyspagenic pain. The calling card of this therapy is efficiency. So typically you can perform this treatment between five and six times per day. The whole goal is to have you do the least number of sessions possible. And you might be able to get better within just a couple of weeks. So McKinsey is really interesting. It's extension-based therapy. If you remember when you're in extension, remember the Nackamson's chart, you actually reduce intervertebral disc pressure when you're in flexion you increase intervertebral disc pressure. And so therefore, extension-based therapy is simply continuously reducing intradiscal intra pressure. I'm not really sure why this coffee is not taking in right now, but you get what I'm trying to say. So there's even better data, I think, for facet injections, as well as manual therapy, as well as trigger point injections. We're all part of sort of the a la carte menu of, of um, services for patients. So. Bottom line, no opiates, please. If you're in a clinical practice and the first go-to for back pain is opiates or muscle relaxants, the, 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 the follow-up statement should be, is that mechanistically sound? So the mechanism by which this patient is having pain, usually nociceptive and neuropathic, does, don't, doesn't match an opiate or a muscle relaxant, right? Whereas if it's nociceptive, inflammatory, and anti-inflammatory would, if it's neuropathic, a nerve membrane stabilizing stabilizing agent would. So just with back pain, it's important to try to let the treatment match the diagnostic and the mechanism of diagnosis. It's critically important to know and also explain to your patients that nociception is not the same as pain. Nociception is a sensory nervous system's response to some sort of a harmful stimuli, but pain is more of an emotional response and an experience. So it's totally independent of the MRI results and really dependent on the person who's sitting in front of you. So someone's pain experience might be 10 out of 10 with minimal anatomic damage, whereas another person's pain experience might be one out of 10 with maximum anatomic damage. It's just important to differentiate those two in your mind. Number of psychosocial factors contribute to pain, which is the experience, um, and the risk of a poor outcome to multimodal rehabilitation. A lot of it has to do with emotion. So there are a few theories out there, fear avoidance theory, shared vulnerability model, and then a theory of misdirected problem solving, they all sort of hover around this concept of emotion. Um, so you really do need to assess your patient's premorbid mood disorders, um, emotional distress that might be going on in their life actively, and then whether or not they have good or poor coping skills to manage that emotional distress. That said, part of a multimodal treatment plan also is mindfulness meditation and formal behavioral therapy, which I always toss in whenever I get the sense that emotions are really driving the bus predominantly. Last little point, and then I'm gonna get to sort of some of the clinical tidbits, um, is you can definitely thank your mom and dad for what happens in your back. So strangely enough, as I mentioned, every single person age of 19 will experience some degree of dis uh, degeneration. The rate at which that happens, the level at which that happens, and how functionally it impacts you is 70% attributable to your genetics. So a lot of it has less to do with what we that what we imagine. Like we did this to ourselves, we actually didn't. Um, uh, the results of the study were that after controlling for lots of factors, um, what they found is that you know the obesity related measures did not increase the risk of low back pain. So people say you know it's my weight, it's my occupation, it's this and that. You can just sort of reassure them. Probably a lot of it has to do with your genetics, and we can move forward. Um, with, with the treatment. Okay, so here are seven clinical pearls that I call Jedi Mind Tricks from my daily clinical practice that just, they just work and they help me. So the first is this, just know that tenderness to palpation can occur in the physical path of the nerve root anywhere along the nerve root. So a person, again, let's take the L4 nerve root, for example. As you can see, this little kind of brown strip, it goes right across that kneecap, comes up to the um, it's more like anterior lateral thigh and it kind of wraps around. Everything passes more or less through the gluteal region. See how this is kind of like a waste basket region where everything comes through. So that's less diagnostic. And then the L4 nerve root, more importantly, hits right there, the medium malleolus. 
So if a person has tenderness to palpation, every single point along this nerve root pathway, they don't have like three diagnoses. They don't have like telecranial pain and a medial mal fracture. No, it could be neuropathic pain along the course of their L4 nerve root. So just keep that in mind. Anywhere along the path of the nerve root, fair game for the patient to show up with tenderness to palpation. When you're trying to figure out is it facet osteoarthritis or lumbar stenosis, and lumbar stenosis could be central or it could be neuroforaminal or both, the question is, do they show up in the exact same way? And usually, actually, yes. So you have to now look at, at demographics, the imaging, what you found on exam, et cetera. In the case of facet osteoarthritis, typically the patient will have worse pain with oblique extension, whereas with lumbar spinal stenosis, particularly centrally, it'll be neutral extension, so just straight extension. Again, patients are very free to have more than one diagnosis. They could have both going on at the same time. And it's our job to tease out which one is predominant, which do we treat first, second, third, fourth, et cetera. <laughs> it's just, I'm not even sure why. Oh, here's another, another clinical pro I toss in there for you guys. Um, little things that I try to tease out. If the patient says they have weather related changes, just think about joints a little bit more, more, more closely, okay? Why? Every, especially facet joints, these are synovial joints, meaning they've got a great tight capsule and they are susceptible therefore to changes in barometric pressure, okay? So they're not making it up when they say, my arthritis is kicking up, I know what's gonna happen with the weather. It's true. So if they say that reliably, or if they don't say that, ask it. Hey, just out of curiosity, does the weather affect your pain in some way? And a lot of times they'll be like, oh my goodness, yes, thank you for asking. And then that leads you more with the diagnosis of a set Osteoarthritis is the main pain driver. Um, another thing is, if they have diagnostic and potentially um, therapeutic use of Tylenol and NSAIDs, that's great information. Tylenol is very good for subchondral bone pain for some reason. It's good for headaches as well, but subchondral bone pain responds really nicely to Tylenol. So if they say, for some reason, Aleve never works, but Tylenol is always great, think about the joint. When it comes to neuroforaminal or central spinal stenosis, worse in the mornings, worse with altitude. Why is that? When we sleep, all of us have a reliable increase in our intradiscal pressure because our discs swell by about one or two millimeters. Remember I told you millimeters matter in the spine. And so if you have central spinal stenosis or even neuroforaminal stenosis where the nerves are trying to exit, imagine your discs become basically a space occupying lesion, worsening the reduction in volume in those spaces. And so first thing in the morning, everything is worse get up and move around, your disc kind of shrink back to normal size and you feel better. Think about spinal stenosis. If the patient says, I tend to lean forward on the shopping cart to when I'm walking in the, in the grocery store, it feels so much better, doc. Think about lumbar spinal stenosis as well. When it comes to diagnostic and potentially therapeutic treatments, if they've taken gabapentin, Lyrica, CBD, gotten amazingly much better, but Tylenol did nothing and Aleve did nothing and Motrin did nothing, think about lumbar spinal stenosis. So not all disc herniation pain is flexion-based pain. Very important to know. Again, I mentioned to you before during one of the slides, if the person has a subarticular disc, meaning their disc has herniated, but it's right under the facet joint, it'll show up in the exact same way as posterior element or facet joint pain. So just think about it that way and really try to envision where the disc fragment or the disc herniation is in relationship to neuro other neural structures. This is just making that point. Point four out of seven, central sensitization in the spinal cord can result in an otherwise unrelated physiological insert reactivated lumbar pain. This is the craziest thing. So one of my colleagues up in, um, in Maine, um, Dr. Frank Willard, he's at the University of New England. If any of you ever have a chance to go work with him, please do. He's one of the greatest neuroanatomists actually globally. Um, he was a former president of the Spine Intervention Society. He travels internationally giving lectures and he's dissected thousands, thousands of spines. And so what he's found is that if you have a knee replacement, a hip replacement, a concussion, strangely, your lumbar pain can just get reactivated in the setting. And it has something to do with central sensitization, particularly in the, in the setting of a chronic lumbar injury. We can come back to that at another time if there's any questions, but it's fascinating. My patients often think that they've gone crazy and they haven't. 
it's sort of like the reactivation of a previously active feedback loop on the spinal cord. Finally, five of seven, continuing antiplatelets and anticoagulants through transfermal epidural steroid injections may be advisable, and you have to sort of weigh the risks and benefits for your patients. So with a spine, it's never a zero-sum game. It's always a little bit of art more, more than science. You've got to kind of take the pros and the cons. And if a person has a risk of stroke, if they're off their anticoagulants or they have a risk of any other catastrophic injury when they're off their anticoagulants, then we need to make our adjustments as interventionists so that they can remain on and still receive their procedure. Number six, patience <laughs> with yourself and with the spine. You must have, I don't know, what is that pad one? Anyway, um, I just found that quote. The thing is, it's never going to be a home run with the spine, particularly in this setting of chronic symptomatology. And so what we're doing is slowly but surely peeling away layers of the onion with our patient, less nociceptive pain, check. Maybe a couple of weeks later, less neuropathic pain, check. A couple of weeks later, increased fitness. It's, it's a process. So it's important to just lay expectations out for your patient and say, like, I'm with you on this journey, and it's going to be a multi-part journey. Finally, if you're going to treat it, by all means, treat it. So I, I, I really hate it when people say they come into the they come into my office and they've seen multiple doctors and they've gotten these halfway non-multimodal treatments. Think about the wraparound approach and attack it from all angles. Um, because the spine, just like an elephant, and the best way to eat it is one bite at a time from all angles. So really think about a robust, multi-part treatment strategy. And um, yeah, your patients typically will get better. So guys, that brings us to the end of my formal clinical presentation. I really hope some of these pearls have been useful, some of these thought frames you can take with you. I'll share the slides as well, so you can just review them on your own. Um, but last but not least, I wanted to just mention, we are doing a thing. So um, the International Society for Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine is one of my favorite organizations of which I'm a part. Um, it's sort of like the global version of AAPMNR between seven and 10,000 physiatrists all over the world and, phys and physiatric scientists are engaged. We have a task force on physical activity for persons with disabilities. So our goal is to use a human rights-based approach to study and disseminate knowledge. Uh, we try to leverage broad expertise and we have members from China, Uganda, America, Morocco, South Korea, Canada, Italy, Qatar, India, Mexico, and Ghana. Like it's the coolest group and we bring together a really broad thought frame um, Yale School of Medicine has shown interest in improving education regarding disability, so we decided we would put on a conference uh, September 30th and October 1st at Yale. Um, the title is Rehabilitation and Physical Activity Pedagogy and Praxis, meaning teaching and practice in modern medical education. The goal is to bring together global rehab and physical activity experts from the WHO, from ISPRM, from the United Nations and other academic institutions who've developed and are designing multi-scale interventions um, in initiatives and curricula. The goal is to kind of, you know, zhuzh up some of what Yale is offering in this area and spark a dialogue and further interest um, in these topics. So uh, it's open to everybody how to get involved, just express interest maybe through this group. I, I think um, Martha Hunter, you, you, you've got a great pulse on, um, on the group and yeah, and hopefully you can contribute in some way, even if it's just participating. Day one, which is September 30th, is a Saturday, is gonna be in-person, kind of an intimate round table with students and other learners. Day two is hybrid. So you can join online if you want to on day two, just to listen in and learn. And that is it. And I have time for questions, I think. And yeah, it's been a real honor to present to you guys. Thank you for the opportunity and for your attention. Thank you so much. That was so wonderful and definitely going to carry a lot of those pearls and just general um, teachings forward. Um, we have some questions in the chat. Um, I think Katie was going to run through whatever came up there. So go definitely. Um, so I can share some of these questions that have been dropped in the chat. Feel free to add more if you have any or just unmute and hop in if you want to ask a question directly. Um, so I think the first question we had I believe this was in, um, Jonathan, if you're, is Jonathan still here? If you want to hop in and clarify, I'm not sure exactly which yeah. slide this was in relation to. Yeah, so um, thank you for the presentation. It was awesome listening to everything you had to say. Um, 
So my question was about the first study that you had mentioned about how different positions kind of load uh, the spine in different different um, weights. I know there was standing, there was side legging, um, there was like slouched over. I was just curious to see if the study had mentioned anything about belly sleeping and how that contributes to um, generating lower back pain. So you're talking about the Nakasim study, right? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. So but so that study back in 1970 um, was simply to find what positions either increase or decrease interdisciplinary pressure in the lumbosacral spine. And so if you're prone, then strangely enough, you're actually in just a little bit of extension usually uh, because of various anatomical variants. Um, you're either neutral or in just a little bit of extension. It's almost like if you imagine doing a cobra. So you would reduce intrinsical pressure. His study didn't specifically look at that, but one could imagine the reduction in intradiscal inter pressure. The reason that is actually kind of important is because basically the McKinsey technique, you'll just hear that phrase a lot. It's some people use it as a catch-all um, phrase for disc rehabilitation, which it's not. It's only for disc injuries that require reduction in um, intradiscal pressure through extension. As I mentioned, if you have a subarticular disc, a far lateral disc, actually that's gonna make you worse. Anyways, so McKinsey therapy is based on that positioning. So you're prone, you do a lot of extension exercises while prone, you do extension exercises while standing, and you reduce intradiscal pressure for those discs, those discs that are paracentrally herniated. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helps. But that Nakamson back in the 70s didn't actually ask specifically when you're sleeping on your belly. Um, but you can imagine that that position essentially is prone, um, which in the lumbar cervical spine can reduce uh, reduce intradiscal pressure. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I can send you the study too if you want to speak. Yeah, that'd be great. Great. So I think also I believe in line with that um, the same slide, the same study weighted question. I think asking about. So standing for long hours at a time, such as during a long surgery, I think maybe if the disc pressure, if there's a time component to this disc pressure. Um, Kate, feel free to jump in and correct me if I'm misinterpreting that. No, that's totally it. I was just, I've also just started surgery today. Um, for <laughs> so it's on the mind. <laughs> yeah. So two comments to that, depending on what you have on. So again, the disc hates a couple of things. It really doesn't like compression, especially when it's axial loaded. So imagine an accordion. So those of us who do interventional spine procedures, we wear lead all day. That essentially is like a weight vest. Okay, so you're just doing good. You're just doing that. And so you're increasing interest compression just by the fact that you're wearing that. Second point, oh, sorry, um, my phone is ringing. Second point is in a healthy spine yes. with optimal biomechanics, meaning you've got a balanced musculoskeletal system, anterior, posterior, right, left, you should be okay standing for long periods of time, it's better to stand and walk than it is to sit. Now, that all depends on the amount of muscular support that your spine is experiencing. So in a well-toned, like a Pilates instructor, for example. So those people, the reason why they do so well and they have like no back pain is because what they're training is not the external abdominal and, and paraspinal muscles. The erector spinae, those are pretty, they look nice on a beach. So is the, the six pack muscle, the obliques look great, but the muscle that's deeper, the transversus abdominis, that's a horizontally oriented muscle that sits just like a corset right around the lumbosacral spine. That is actually what provides the best support, like a buttress to the spine. So when that's toned, you can withstand anything. You can withstand high, high performance training. You can withstand standing in surgery for a long time. You can withstand being a paratrooper. You know, it's, so it depends, I would say, Yes, these positions are better and are worse for your spine, but you also have to ask yourself in what condition are the surrounding structures? So when you're going to something where you're gonna be tested and where your, your spine might be biomechanically disadvantaged, maybe think about tossing in a few dead bugs, you know, in the morning or like just trying to do some exercises that do tone your deep abdominal stabilizers, which serve as a buttress for the lumbosacral spine writ large. Also which is why physical therapy assessments are always very instructive. They, if you do a full assessment, you can see where you're tight and where you need, where you need lengthening and where you're long and need 
constriction, right? So some parts of your body, for example, most of us, our hip flexors are very tight, so we sit all day. We could probably do with some daily stretches in that area just to rebalance the forces in and around the lumbosacral spine. So I would say, yes, not great to stand for long periods, but in the setting of a well-supported spine, particularly with increased transverse abdominus tone, should be okay because the spine actually is oriented in a beautiful lordosis that should be able to distribute pressure um, adequately while standing and walking. Is that helpful? So it's always was, more, it's always, it's always more than meets the eye. <laughs> that was so helpful. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Great. Um, so the next question we had was about using a uh, duloxetine for neuropathic pain. Oh, my nemesis. Thoughts. My nemesis. So, so yes, duloxetine is in that zip code. It's true. Like if you look at gabapentin, so I use the word gabapentinoid. You could also look at neuropathic agents, all the same general. SNRIs are, are funny because they have this dual purpose, right? You've got the mood um, impact and you've got the neuropathic impacts. Yes. Anecdotally, and I had this conversation with one of my colleagues the other day. It's hard to wean off of it. And I don't find it as efficacious anecdotally as my gabapentin, as my Lyrica, especially gabapentin because gabapentin is super clean. It hardly interacts with anything. So it's utilized, it's on the list. So is amitriptyline and other, other medications in that same category. Um, but anecdotally, and this is again, just from having just a spine focused practice, it has a little minimal when it comes to its efficacy unless the person has a major mood component and it could be hard to turn it off in the aftermath if it's not effective. So it's on the list, not my favorite. Awesome, thank you. Um, let's see, I'm not seeing any other, or Jonathan, do you have another question? Yeah, I have one more question. Um, <clears throat> I guess in your experience or your what are your opinions about um, the efficacy or ineffectiveness between a transferaminal steroid injection versus intralaminal um, steroid injection, I know that is very highly controversial, um, but I'm curious to see as what your experience has been or what your opinions are about it. Yeah, you gotta be, you gotta, so good question. And tell, can you talk to me a little bit more about why you say that it's controversial? Um, Cause I've read, I've read a few studies where they say Intralaminar is better in certain situations. Some say transferaminal are better in certain situations. And then there are some papers out there that are say there's not really much difference. So, yeah. So you have to you have to clarify exactly what you're trying to do. So an interlaminar versus a transferaminal injection is just basically entering a house from a different approach, right? Using a door or a window. And if you imagine the structures that you were trying to bathe with your lidocaine, saline, and, and, and steroid, there's two things you're trying to accomplish. A, mechanically remove uh, debris. So there's usually some sort of anti, there's like an inflammatory milieu. There's physical schmutz in the area. Imagine mm -hmm. a sidewalk after a storm with a bunch of leaves on it. So the first thing is mechanically like hosing that area down, removing some of the uh, neuro, uh, neurologic elements that are like actually causing, causing pain. That's a, point number one. Point number two is every now and again, you're trying to coat some structure that is inflamed in your steroid. And so the question is, what's the best way to do that? What's in the way? Spinal cord is in the way when you do an interlaminar epidural steroid injection. If someone is post-surgical and you have a hard path to get a transferminal going, interlaminar might be your best choice in that case. If you're trying to get a paracentral or lateral disc, or if you're trying to get as close to the spinal cord or close to the back of the disc as possible, for whatever reason, you're just trying to get to the back of the disc, a transferaminal is the smartest because it's going to get you there physically closer, even if it's just by one or two millimeters. All that said, the medication flows. <laughs> so you inject this medication and it goes into a stream. You don't know how it's going to go. It's, it's very interesting um, when you watch the, the flow patterns um, under fluoroscopy. Sometimes it goes in a direction that you never expected. And so then you can, in that moment, change, go to two level, add the interlaminar. Like you have to be able to really think about the anatomy of that particular patient and decide the route that's gonna get the medication to where you need it to go. If I, one of the approaches that we used to do a lot in fellowship that I, that I still do in practice is either a bilateral transferminal L5 ESI at, in order to get to the back of the disc of the L5S1 disc, not for any ridiculous symptoms. It's just for discogenic axial pain. So if someone has an annular fissure, 
causing axial back pain, and I just want to get some steroid back there to coat it. I might do bilateral L5s, right? Just to get there. Mm -hmm. Or not because they have bilateral L5 radiculopathy though. Or I will do a caudal epidural steroid injection, right? Because the caudal allows you to use a particulate steroid and a higher volume solution. So some caudals can go up to 10 milliliters, 12 milliliters, 15 milliliters, and you've really got more of a zip code approach. You bathe the back of multiple discs, which may be where you think the pain is being generated from. So in clinical practice, I, I think it's important to be very critical and constantly think, how can I optimize my approach for this patient sitting in front of me, rather than have a one size fits all approach because no back is the same and the demands on that back aren't the same either. Great, that was awesome, thank you. I just have one question, uh, kind of going back to the article you were talking about where you know, at six months, people were like starting to have pain, but within the first six months, you know, people actually did pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm curious if there's been kind of studies looking at agents like it's more extended release steroids that can last longer or possibly like regenerative type medicine things and PRP uh, to kind of extend beyond that six months. Yeah, I love this. They're coming. They're coming. So um, up, up, out in New York, they have um, Dr. Singh, um, Greg Lutz, he's got a whole regenerative spine care institute um, where he's doing, he's got huge amounts of data. It's kind of global data. It's and it's it's coming, it's coming. So if you uh regenerative spine care institute, I think is a good one. Um Toby, uh, which is sort of like a big interventional spine uh group, also. If you ever go to their conferences, you'll see a lot of really cool stuff coming out. Um, and I think I think we'll we'll start to see more and more of that uh into the future. Regenerative stuff can be a little scary um because we don't have long-term data, we don't know how it changes some of the spine structures, for example. Does, if you put PRP intradiscally, does it ossify after five years, 10 years, 15 years, and create something more like kyphoplasty, which you don't want in the nucleus pulsus sitting right next to the annulus fibrosis, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So these, these, these studies are actually exciting, but for those of us who think about like 10, 15, 20 years down the line, we're still gonna see this patient. <laughs> we're like, can we just confirm that it's not gonna make things worse? <laughs> yeah, and RSI is doing that all the all the scientists through Toby are doing that, and so keep yeah watch their spaces. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. You're so welcome, guys. All right, I want to be mindful of everyone's time, and we'll probably call it there. Those are some great questions and and great yeah, conversations and discussion that we've had. Thank you for an amazing presentation. We You're welcome. Hopefully, it was helpful. I really do. And I and I I'm so excited that you guys are interested in the in the area. So thank you. Thank you so much. We will um share more information about the conference in the fall, um, so that everyone can kind of stay in the loop about that and potential opportunities to get involved because I think people will be really excited about that. So Amazing. thank you for, for sharing that. Um and we'll stay in touch too. But thank you so much, Dr. Talk. You're welcome. Have a great night, guys. Thank you so much.